He's getting me in faith. Because when Adam fell, he fell to serving time rather than time serving him. And so time is a hard taskmaster. It will enslave you. Time wants to dictate to you how long it's going to take. Time was a created thing just like trees. Just like Jesus could curse a fig tree, Jesus could regulate time. And what he did, you do. Because this whole thing is to bring us back to the level of our original operation. So most of our timing, most of our planning has been according to time. But here's the deal. Increase doesn't come by time, it comes by truth. And truth is the highest realm of reality. And truth is written in heaven. And what you do with faith is you reach up into the eternal and bring your promises back down into the now. A season of miracles. Now, let's go back to Judges in chapter 6. This is where we ended up last time in terms of our foundation text at least. And in Judges chapter 6, let's start reading here at verse 11. And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak which is an Ophrah that pertaineth to Joas, the Abyssalite, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. Now the Midianites were oppressing these children of Israel. That is not the way things were supposed to be. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him, and he said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thy mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, O oh, my Lord, <laughs> if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. So how many of you know the Lord will never leave you or forsake you? So he didn't bring you out of bondage to forsake you. He got you born again and now he's going to help you. And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? All this is key now. And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. Now all this is Gideon busy trying to disqualify himself. And sometimes we do that. You know, we, we going to tell God uh, what, what he can do with us. You know, if God can make a donkey preach, really, then you, you know he can do something with you. And the Lord said unto him, surely I'll be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as what? One man. One translation says, you'll crush them as easy as they were one man. Now this is Gideon. This is a man that basically did not have it all together. How many of you know some folk like that? Just turn to your neighbor and say, you have it all together though. Okay. Now, <laughs> uh, in Psalm chapter 113 and verse 7, the Bible says, he raises up the poor out of the dust and lifted up the needy out of the dunghill. 
that he may set him with princes, even with the princes of his people. So God specializes in making a nobody somebody. <laughs> specializes in it. And a lot of times what happens is we don't depend on God to do it. We try to do it ourselves and we fall way short of it. So we're talking about this man Gideon and how God's going to use him and he's going to use him to absolutely turn this uh, renegade bunch of Midianites at that time and be able to overcome them. So as we look at this, Gideon asked the question, he said, now, where are all the miracles that we heard about? And so that's the question that we want to ask today in the church. That where are all the miracles that happened in the book of Acts? Not only in the synagogue, but happened outside the synagogue in the marketplace. Where, where are all these miracles now? Now, <clears throat> Let me give you a, a little bit of a context here by which we're going to uh, get into this message. God is expecting his people to grow up. He is not expecting us to be stagnant and stay where we are. As a matter of fact, he said over in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16 and 17, he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from what? Faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. How are you to live? You're going to live by faith. Now, that doesn't mean to quit your job, go sit on a park bench and feed the pigeons. It means that you're going to use your faith at that job. That job is not going to be your source. God's going to be your source and supply. And if he wants to use the job as a channel, that's fine. So as you look at this, this whole idea of moving from faith to faith is a key. And so when we say, well, what happened? Why? Uh, why aren't the miracles taking place? We begin to go through that and try to look at what is keeping these miracles from happening. And we're finding out that people are really not in faith. They haven't developed their faith. And as a matter of fact, they've been using somebody else's faith. Somebody else has been doing all the praying for them. <clears throat> Don't make me shout now. <laughs> and so forth. But God has plans for each one of us to develop his or her own faith. Now, what I've found is that when you're talking about faith, you're talking about a time zone of now. That faith is not the future. You can't say I'm going to be healed and be in faith. If God plans for us to live by faith, then we're going to have to learn what faith is and how to operate that faith. Just look at this whole concept because we're, we're, we're asking the question now, what, what happened to miracles? Why are they not seen in the church? Let's go over to 2 Kings and chapter 4. Now this is where a woman came to the man of God. All right. One of the biggest reasons for your man of God or the prophet, one of the the, one man said the number one, the number one job of a prophet is to give you something to say 
or something to do. The Bible talks about, I, I'm, I know I'm at first King, second King chapter four, but let me go to one more scripture first. Let's go over to Romans chapter 10 and verse 12. Let's just start right there. I just want you to see this now because it's going to be profound today. I want you to get it. He says, for there's, there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. That for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be what? Saved. Then he says, how then shall they call on him who they've not believed? Well, how can they believe on him who they've not what? Heard. And how shall they hear without a who? Preacher. And how shall he preach except he be sent? Then it goes down to verse 17 and it says, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now you got, you see what it's saying. So now what I do is I spend time in the word. Now after I spend time in the word, now the word is in me. Now I prepare a meal because I'm going to give you the word because you didn't have the time to spend in the word that I did because this is my job. But I'm spending time in the word so that I could come and give you the word. And more specifically, the Bible says over in Isaiah, God pours water on ground that's thirsty. So basically you can draw out of me the portion of the word that you need to solve your situation. Say amen to that. And that's why the apostle Paul writes in first Corinthians chapter three and verse 20, 21, he says, all things are yours. Then he goes to the next verse, whether Paul or Paulus or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present, things to come, all are yours, but you belong to Christ and Christ belong to God. So all are yours, including the prophet that's in front of you. The anointing on my life belongs to you. So I study and I get the word, then I come and give it to you. Now I'm sent. All right, now with that in mind, let's go back over here. I'm telling you why there have been no miracles. Let's go back over here now and let's go back to 2 Kings chapter 4 again to start at verse 1. I'll start reading that. Now there, cry, there, there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets to Elisha saying, thy servant, my husband is dead. And you know that my husband, thy ser that thy servant did fear the Lord and the creditor has come to take him to my two sons to be bondmen. In other words, we're in debt. The man of the house has died. Now here come some people to take my sons and put them in bondage, in slavery, to work off the debt because we owe this money. Now the thought is that her husband was, the, was a man who hid the prophets from Jezebel. Because you know she was killing all the righteous prophets. And she hid them. But apparently it cost him some money. So he's doing a good work for God, but he's paying for it. Stay with me now. And now he's in debt because he's borrowed the money. But now this woman cries to the man of God and Elijah said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me what is in your house. And she said, the handmaiden is not anything in the house save a pot of oil. This is all she has. Then he said, go borrow thy vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels borrow not a few. Now let's just stop right there for just a minute. The miracle here, the first one, is that she trusted her man of God. <laughs> That's the first miracle. She went to him, cried, meaning that she put pressure on that covenant. And he came forth with an answer. Now, One of the 
first jobs of the prophet is to give you something to say or something to do. Because in situations, you got to believe something and say something. Now, he's not going to give you something to say that maybe or do that maybe sounds reasonable. Because he's not after human reason. He's after faith. You got to realize that faith has no has but one time zone. Now. And if it's not now, it's not faith. So here's this man of God. <clears throat> he comes. He tells her what to do. She receives it. And she gets her sons to go out and get, get vessels. Now here's the key. Many times the people of God make plans according to time. I'd like you to revisit that. Make plans according to faith. I remember <laughs> we were putting up the Joseph Business School and I told two of the members at that time, they were, I mean, they were still with the school, but I told them, I said, hey, I want you to help me put this school up. Go out and tell me how long it's going to take to put this school up. They went out and came back to me. And these are people with MBAs and finest universities. So they came and told me it's going to take anywhere from eight months to 12 months. I said, well, give me the plan. Let me go before the Lord. I went before the Lord. The Lord said, put it up in two months. Now notice what he's doing. He's getting me in faith. Because when Adam fell, he fell to serving time rather than time serving him. And so time is a hard taskmaster. It will enslave you. Time wants to dictate to you how long it's going to take. Time was a created thing just like trees. Just like Jesus could curse a fig tree, Jesus could regulate time. And what he did, you do. Because this whole thing is to bring us back to the level of our original operation. So most of our timing, most of our planning has been according to time. But here's the deal. Increase doesn't come by time, it comes by truth. And truth is the highest realm of reality. And truth is written in heaven. And what you do with faith is you reach up into the eternal and bring your promises back down into the now. Now I'm telling you why this doesn't happen, see, because people see, now somebody might give you a time. They say, well, it's going to take six months for this to be healed. That is what they've been trained at. That's the level of a fallen man. That's still the technology that they have today. But you are going to the supernatural. You're not going to have to wait on payday. You can bring payday into this day. Now, that, just stay with me now. Here's the woman, that's what she said. Jesus approached the tomb of uh, the grave uh, area of Lazarus and Martha said, if you had only been here earlier, my husband would not have died. Notice he ran out of time. And he said, wait a minute, your husband shall live again. She did, he said, I know he'll live again in the resurrection and the what? The last day. See, when the last day is when all the saints arrive, everybody's going to come. Their, 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 their spirits 
are going to, the, they're going to get bodies like Jesus. The, the body that Jesus got when he got raised from the dead is a glorified body. It's a body that can walk through the wall and then sit down and eat fish. It, it's a body, come on now. It, it's about, he left the holes in his hands so he could show you that he's the one who did die for you. But it's a glorified body and you and I are going to get one of those. Now that's what we're going to get in the general resurrection. We're going to get that. That's the last day. But Jesus said, let me tell you who I am. I am the resurrection. I'm the one who came from the last day and I'm in this day. And wherever I am, the time is now. And you can get whatever you want to get in the last day. You can get it today. And what did he do? Raise Lazarus up. Are y'all following me? So I'm saying in terms of you and I, remember time was a created thing. Genesis chapter one and verse 14, it'll tell you God created times and seasons and so forth. He didn't create time. Time didn't always exist. He created it to keep the order of the earth, but it was never meant that you serve time. It was meant that time serve you. Folks, if folks know how to use this, they can take their faith on a 20 year sentence in jail and get out in 20 days. I'm talking about getting born again and get on out. My, my point to you is, is that what are you saying here? Wait a minute now. This, 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 this woman, she's got a situation and she's under a, a time restraint here. This, these creditors are knocking at the door. I don't know whether you've been there before. But when I was coming up and I didn't know all these principles and I wasn't saved and I'm deep in debt, we didn't have no phone ID. When that phone rang, you had to take your chances, brother. You, you look at it a couple of rings first. You look at it and size that thing up. Now, what am I saying to you? I'm saying as far as you're concerned, you're not limited to this fallen counterfeit society that's been built because of Adam's sin and Satan's dominion. Satan wants you in time because in time there are no miracles. Miracles operate by faith and faith is always when now. So the moment he gave me, he said, tell him it's going to be two months. And I gave him two months, but they had to receive it. See, they, they had a choice. They could have said, oh, I don't believe that, but pastor. Uh, now, well, let me show you an example of that. Second Kings chapter seven, look at that. And look at verse one. And look at what he said here. And Elijah said, hear ye the word of the Lord. Now understand these people starving and I mean, they're cooking babies and everything else. Thus saith the Lord God, tomorrow, about this time, shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel and the two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. In other words, tomorrow is going to be plenty and it's going to be cheap. you got to believe the one that's sent. See, you, 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 you got a choice. you got a choice. And a lot of preachers are trying to preach what is reasonable. That's what happened in Numbers chapter 13. They said, hey, let us go up at once to possess it. We're well able to overcome it. Right away, the 10 of the, the leaders or preachers came and said, oh, we're not going to be able to overcome that. The giants in that land, look what, we're just like grasshoppers in their own life. That looked reasonable. I'm not trying to satisfy your flesh. I'm preaching on a spiritual level. And God wants you on a spiritual level so that the miracles can take place. Amen. Now what happens? <clears throat> so next thing you know, miracles start happening. Got the school up in two months and now we have a fully accredited business school for God. But as long as we were trying to get by on time, he kept delaying us. So God on purpose will put you out of reason over into faith. You do it on purpose. Well, I'm a little short on time. Good. 
Praise God. Now we about to see a miracle now. Miracles are now. Boy, that's, that's a tweet right there. They're not tomorrow. They're right now. I said they're right now. You remember the woman uh, here was Jesus. He came to the wedding of Cana and he walked in here and then uh, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. He said, well, what is that to me? My hour is not yet come. That's John chapter two. My hour is not yet come. And, and Jesus, and she said this, she didn't even pay any attention to it. She said, whatever he said to you, just do it. Talking to the servants now. And, and that's what they did. Notice what he said. He said, fill the water pots up with water. Now, he, they don't know what's going to happen, but he's telling them what to do. See, a lot of times you don't know what's going to happen, but you just receive by faith what to do. Come on now. And you just do what you do. See, because you don't have to wait on time. You don't even have to wait on time to think. Boy, I know I'm getting... I'm going, can I go out there? Put that scripture back up there again that you just had there. And so notice what he says here. He said, Jesus said to them, fill the water pots up with water. And they fill them up to the brim. Look at this. And he said to them, draw out now and bear to the governor of the feast. And they bear it. All right. And when he, the ruler of the feast tasted that water was made wine, he knew not which it was. But the servant the, that drew the, which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast, feast, ta, uh, feast called the bridegroom and he said to him, every man at the beginning does set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, got drunk, then you pull out that stuff that's bad, praise God. Pull out that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until what? Now, next verse. In the beginning, this is the beginning of what? Miracles. Now my point to you is, is that what do you have to do to make wine? You have to take one, you have to plant the seed. You have to plant the seed, wait on the vine to grow. You wait on the vine to grow, that's a number of years. They tell me about nine years. Then once those uh, grapes start growing on the vine, then you've got to take the grapes. Once you pull the grapes, you've got to take the grapes in and you've got to mash the grapes. Once you mash the grapes, you've got to sit the wine up and let it ferment. And sometimes the older the wine, the longer it fermented, the better the wine. Come on now, y'all used to be. Yeah, yeah. And the better the wine. But my point to you is, is look at all the steps that are in between this miracle. Say amen. amen. So notice what he did. He jumped over all those steps because you don't have to do it in time. You do it by faith. And then he said, you've served the best wine until now. Best wine, do you know to get the best wine is something like 200 years or something that that wine has been kept in those bottles and so forth? And tell me if you, if one man looked on the internet to see what the best wine would cost. A, best, a bottle of the best wine was costing about $320,000. For the best wine. And how much did they have there? They had 30 gallons in each one of the five water pots. Now that's a whole lot of best wine. So I know what they were doing. They weren't going to drink all of that. That was going to be a wedding gift for the wedding couple. Because when they drunk that little bit, he's going to take the rest, sell it, and they're going to have plenty of money to live on. Because at that time, when you get married, no man or woman supposed to work for one year. They're supposed to get to know one another for one year. Come on now. They got plenty to live on. Come on. We got bread coming with this. Supernatural is where we came from. We came from a supernatural God. The world doesn't know this because they're not born again. They have to wait on time. We don't. We've got faith. And faith is always when? Now. It's right now, folks. It's right now. Isn't this good? Yeah. So, now, let's just look at this because I'm still talking about um, um, Adam in the garden. So the next thing happens is that in verse 7 of chapter 2, let's go there, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. 
And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breaths of life. And man became a living soul. Now one translation says in the Hamash translation, they tell me that he became a speaking spirit like God. Now I shared with you this one other time and man shared with me and I really, really believe it's so. He said, when God stood Adam up beside him, angels thought they were seeing double. That's how much man was made like God. And if you go on down here, if you look, it said, uh, let's say uh, verse eight, and the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Verse 15, and the Lord God took the man, put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden thou shalt be freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge, underline knowledge please, of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day you eat of it, thou shalt, uh, thereof thou shalt surely what? God. Now this is where this thing really starts taking a turn of revelation. Because the first thing that happens, let's just look at this. The first thing that happens. He said, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. Knowledge, the word knowledge, underline it. In the Hebrew, the word is diath, D-A in your space, A-T-H, diath. And it means knowledge gained by senses. Knowledge gained by senses. So Adam, here's the deal. You eat of this, you're going to be disconnected from me. And all the knowledge you're going to get from then on is going to come through your senses. Now, how is that different? Because Adam was not meant to be led by his senses. He was meant to be led by the spirit. God is not talking to your flesh. He is talking to your mind, your spirit rather. Okay. Now, now if you look at this, this situation that Adam is in, he then goes here in verse th in chapter three and they eat of it. Now, if you start reading at verse six, he said, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it's pleasant to the eyes and a tree desired to make one wise, she took the fruit thereof and did eat and gave it also to her husband with her and he did eat. And the eyes of both of them, the eyes of them both were open and they knew that they were naked. Now, weren't their eyes open to see the tree? Okay, so you know something's wrong with that. So what happened? Adam died spiritually. Now he didn't die in his body for about 900 years later. So basically he was a walking dead man. Like folk today. They're walking, but they're walking dead. Now God doesn't want to leave them like that. But the only time they got a, cho a choice, make a choice to live again is while they're walking. That they're going to have to make a choice now. You know what I'd do if I wasn't saved? I'd get saved. When? Now. Okay, so there's some definite advantages to this. So now, this knowledge of good and evil. So now, Adam eats of it, and now he falls. And when he falls, all of his knowledge now is coming by his senses. In other words, 
he began to live a life from knowledge gained from the outside in. From his senses, his five senses, his five senses had to tell him something. You, you need your senses. You, you, if somebody asked me what color dress does she have, I say it has a red dress. Well, how can I know that? Because I can see it. But if that's shut down, I can't tell you. So right there, my knowledge becomes limited. And this idea of being able to pick up things from the senses is what the enemy wants because now he can control what you see. And when he controls what you see, you thought you were looking at this, but he did that and you saw that and interpreted that way and made a, a, a decision based on that, but it was the wrong decision because you were deceived from what you saw. Can I, can I, can I say this? So now here man is in a bad situation, so he fell. He fell from being the second down all the way down to under Satan. Now Satan became the God of this world. So what does Satan do? He affects his mind. He blinds the mind. He makes it, why? Because he knows his mind and his senses are the only thing he's got to guide him. But like I said, Jesus came to restore us back to our original mode of operation. Say amen to that. So once man fell, the birth of education began. Because man didn't learn before. He discerned. Education was born. Now, let's look at it. When Jesus came, he restored some things. So let's look at this. It's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9. Let's start right there. He says this, but as it is written, this is the apostle Paul talking, the eye has not seen, that's your natural eye. Your ear has not heard, that's your natural ear. Neither has entered into the heart of man, that's a natural part of you, the things which God has prepared for them that love him. But God has revealed them to us by his what? Spirit. He's now, we're, once you're born again, you're alive to God again, and he's talking spirit to spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of a man that's in him? See, that's your potential. Your potential is not in your flesh. Your potential, if your potential is in your flesh, Peter never could have walked on that water. Because the potential was in his flesh. And can no flesh stand on top of water? But it's when your potential is in your spirit, it takes dominion over your flesh and you can walk right on that water. Glory to God. Oh, yeah, y'all messing with me now. Let, let me. <laughs> so what happened? So here he's saying that your spirit knows all about you. See, that's why when I pray at the beginning of the year, I cannot pray. I say, Lord, what do you want to do this year? I want to know what you want to do with the ministry. I want to know what you want to do with me. Well, I have to get his plan. Because if I let myself think of my plan, I just want to do something that I feel in my natural mind I can do. When I'm much bigger on the inside than I am on the outside. Amen. Say amen to that. So God will tell me something and guaranteed every time he tells me, it seems like it's impossible. But it's not impossible for my spirit because once my spirit hears it, it loves the impossible. All right. Come on. My faith is energized by the impossible. Right. Are, are you all with me now? Yeah. So I'm planning supernaturally and by faith instead of planning by time. Amen. Now, is, am I getting too deep for you? No. Okay. So your spirit knows all about you. Your mind doesn't. Your mind only knows what it's experienced. But your spirit knows all about you and God knows all about your spirit. You can't listen to your human logic because nowhere in the Bible did logic produce a miracle. You got to come out of there. 
on now. When he tells you, okay, all right, you got that 30 year mortgage, okay, all right, let's get that paid off in 30 days. Right. Oh no, Reverend, how are we gonna do that? You're not gonna do it with your natural pea brain, you're gonna do it with the Spirit of God operating by faith, cutting through time, and making this thing a reality right now. Stop trying to adjust your life according to human reason and what you've experienced back there with mama and them. Y'all know what I mean by mama and them? Stop, stop trying to run your life based on that. Get to the book and think with the word. If this Bible says you can do all things through Christ which strengthens you, that's what it means. You look at it and you look at yourself. I mean, just, just tell yourself you're going to fast for three days. And what? Well, the next thought is, is uh, happy meals. Come on, the next thought. You, you do it. Because this mind here, it wants to be the boss. Your flesh wants to be the boss. You get saved, your spirit says, let's go to church. Flesh says, riverboat. I mean, it's call it. Why? Because it ain't saved. But it's not the boss. Paul says, I keep under my body. Not I put it under. You got to put it under and keep that rest of that. Now you can do much more than you think you can do. And don't go in that classroom. I can't work no math. What did you just do? You spoke words that blocked the door to your deliverance. You can't do it. Whatever you think you can, can't do, say you can. Say amen to that. Stop confessing curse on yourself. He said your angels are going to be with you and they're going to be listening to everything you It's illegal for God to do one thing for you and you're confessing something else. The law of faith says that whatever God will do for you, you won't have to confess it first. So I don't care how difficult it looks, say it. You find a promise in that Bible, get in that promise and meditate that thing. I'm talking about fill up your mind, fill up your heart with that word of God and then start speaking that thing. It's a law. It's got to come to pass. Are y'all with me? Remember. Miracles are easier than doing things in that progression of time. Right. Yes, sir. Hmm. Amen. Yes, sir. Miracles are not always spectacular, folks. Right. You don't have to have no big splash, no dynamite need to go all boom. You don't have to do that. Miracles can come on in so easy to you won't even notice they came. Whoa, what happened here? Human reason became the deciding factor of whether something was possible or not because of Adam's fall. Jesus came to reverse that. I can do all things through Christ who strengthen me. Here's what Jesus said. It's not me, it's the Father in me. He's doing the work. Let's go to Galatians chapter five. But the fruit of the spirit is love joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such, there is no law. Here he is speaking about supernatural disposition. All right, let's tell you what I mean by that. Once you get born again, you don't have to pray for peace. 
you have peace. <laughs> By faith, you cause peace to come out. So, you're in a situation, and it's a situation that there's a great deal of fear and affliction and so forth in that situation. You can operate in peace. Watch this. And they can be affected by it. Oh yeah. You're going in where giants are. Watch this. They'll pull out a file on you and say, now, she used to react when we shortened her chat. <laughs> come on, come on now, come on now. I'm talking about a dossier on you. I'm talking about if, since you were a kid, some, somebody been tracking you. You know how the FBI do, they try to get over So what happened? I'm saying, how about self-control? Say so now, one demon talking to another. Now, if you push this button, she gonna cuss you. She gonna cuss. Just, just push this button right here. She gonna cuss. Now, push, push it. Watch, watch it. Push it. Push. Push. Oh, Lord Jesus! I thought she was saved. Okay. Now, now, just listen to what I'm saying now. Supernatural disposition. Here's a brother, instead of having temperance or self-control, he didn't have any. He wasn't saved, and he ended up doing 20 years. No self-control. But you're going into a land of giants. They are button pushers. Why? They know you came there to dispossess them. They know you came in there to get rich. They know you showed up to get healed. And if they can just push this button, you'll forget about the healing and cuss him out. No, 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 listen, not, 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 not you. I'm not saying that you. I'm not saying that you. I, I, you I'm, I'm using an extreme example. But I'm saying you'll lose it. See, and when you lose it, you lose faith. And faith is the thing to get you to your destiny. Is this making sense to you now? Now, how can you overcome that? The first step is you must be born again. If you're not born again, you can't stop it because they are much mightier than you. Put up there, Deuteronomy again, Deuteronomy chapter 7, please, and verse 1. Just put it up there. Watch this. I'm taking you into the Canaan now. Watch this. When the Lord thy God shall bring you into the land where you go in to possess it and has cast out many, many nations from before thee, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Havites, and the Jebusites, seven nations, what? greater and mightier. No human can defeat the devil. Over in Judges chapter 6, this is um, a situation here where um, this man Gideon is being called by God to do something great. And I think every one of us has been called by God to do something great. God has enough greatness to go around to all his people. Look at verse seven, let's just start there. And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried to the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you forth out of the house of bondage. And I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all that oppressed you and drave them out from before you and gave you that their, that their land. And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God, fear not the gods of the Amorites 
in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. Let's just stop right there. All right, now let's just see what the Lord did. Because we're talking about miracles and supernatural. Here's God, and God is bringing this nation of people out of Egypt. And he's bringing them in through the wilderness into Canaan. All right, let's just take it step by step. So first he's bringing them out of Egypt. And if you look at Exodus chapter 3, starting at verse 19, he talks about how re the resistance that they're going to have in coming out. He says, and I'm sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go, no, not by a mighty hand. And another translation says, not unless he's forced to do so. Now that's very important unless he's forced to do so. Now, how do we force him to do so? Let's go to Psalm 66. I'm gonna travel with these scriptures now. Psalm 66 and verse three. He must be forced to do so. Say unto God, how terrible art thou in thy works. Through the greatness of thy power shall thine enemies submit themselves to you. Through the greatness of thy power shall the enemies submit themselves. So Satan is going to only submit to power. You're not up against an intellectual devil. I don't care how much education you got, so forth and so on. You will never first outwit him with that and you will never be able to conquer him with that. Okay. So you're going to need power. Now where is this power found? Let's go over to Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10. And over in Ephesians 6 and 10, he says, Find him, my brother, and be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. He said, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For you wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You can't get out of there if you wanted to. I'm sure the king of Egypt will not let you go. Not with any power that you can manifest. You will have to get my power. Now let's just look at this. Look at Joshua chapter 1, starting in verse 3. And look what he says. He said, every place the sole of your foot shall tread upon that have I given you. As I said unto Moses. Talking to Joshua now. He's taking over from the leadership of Moses. From this wilderness... And this Lebanon, even to the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto all the great sea toward the going down to the sun shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not fail you or what? Forsake you. Now notice what he said here in this verse. There will not any man be able to stand before you. So there's nothing that can stop you from reaching your destiny but you. When he says any man, he means any system, any army, it doesn't make any difference. No, he says in here, as I was with Moses, so I'm going to be with you. So we need to see how was he with Moses, because that's the way he's going to be with me. Because I'm going up against an enemy that I cannot defeat myself. Because God's going to bring you into a place. He's taking them into a place where the supernatural is not an option anymore. It's a requirement. He's taking you where the supernatural is not an option, it's a requirement. Let me come over here. He's taking you into a place where the supernatural is not an option, it's a requirement. A lot of times saints are looking for some church, they don't have to use any faith. Don't look any further. They're going to be, they, they're not going to be out there. You will have to use some faith everywhere you go. Because we're coming into that kind of time in this earth. If nothing else, you need to use your faith to stop this weather from coming in here like it is. All right, let's see how I was with Moses. This is Exodus chapter 23. And this is the way he was with Moses. Behold, verse 20, verse 20. Behold, I sent an angel before you. Lord have mercy. Right there is going to be supernatural. Because can normally you see an angel? Normally? Normally, 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 no, okay? So you're going to have to believe you got something with you that you can't even see. 
And this is where you're going to get that which God has promised you, because that land that he's promised you is a promised land. I sent an angel before you to keep you in the way and to bring you into the land which I have prepared. Watch this. Beware of him now and obey his voice. Don't provoke him, for he will not forgive you. Pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. Look what the next verse says. But if you will indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I'll be an enemy to your enemies. I'll be an adversary to your adversaries. And my angels shall go before you and bring you into the land of the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hivites, Jebusites, Parasites. Oh, no, that wasn't up there. And I, and I will do what to them? I'm here to tell you where he's leading you. The supernatural is not an option anymore because you're in a season, a season of a supernatural. And when I say that, I mean this. I mean, when they were in that season, God said, you're going over. And they didn't want to go over. They said, no, we don't want his giants in the land and so forth. Now, what did God do? He tried to get them. He tried to get them. He pleaded with them and so forth. But pretty soon, God said, no. You missed your season. You're not going. And don't pray to me anymore. That's in the book. That's it. It's only so long that you're going to be able to hang back. This is going to help you now. I don't know about you, but I said, Lord, don't take nobody in my place. You might laugh at that, but that was serious coming from me. I don't want him to take anybody into anything that I'm supposed to do. I want him to stand, I want to stand before Jesus and him say, well done, Bill Winston. Amen. It's time to stop playing church. Amen. You're not coming in here just to see who got outfits on and looking for some man or whatever have you. That's not the game. You're coming in here for me to build your faith so you won't miss your season. That's where we are. That's going to be in churches all over the world. That bunch held back, they complain, they, they were jealous of each other, so forth and so on. And pretty soon God said, that's it. Season. There's seasons with God. And when that door opens, he expects you to go through it. And stop making excuses. All right, let's go back to Gideon again. And that verse that we left off with, whatever verse you left off with, that's the verse I want you to start with. And it said to you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the gods of the Amorites whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. And there came an angel of the Lord and set her in an oak, which is Oprah, in Oprah that pertained to Joash the Abyssalite, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the Midianites were oppressing Israel. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him, Gideon, and said unto him, The Lord is with you, thy mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles? which our fathers had told us of, saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. How many of you know the Lord will never forsake you? Amen. Say, God is, good. God is good. And the Lord up and looked upon him and said, go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? And he said unto him, O oh my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. Now notice what he's doing. He's busy trying to disqualify himself. You see, when God calls you, he appoints you. And when he appoints you, he anoints you. And when he anoints you, and your divinely positioned, yes. 
nothing can stop you. So look what he says here. He says, the Lord said unto him, surely I'll be with you. And thou shalt smite the, the Midianites as one man. As one man. And I did a whole study of one man. Look up in David. Over in 1 Samuel chapter 17, starting at verse 45. Then said David to this Philistine, this is a giant. Now this is one who had been trained in war from his youth. You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield? Well, I'm coming to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied this day, not next Saturday. This day will the Lord deliver you into my hand. Now this is one man. And I will smite your head off. I'm going to cut it off. And I'm going to take your head from you. And I will give the carcasses of the whole army host of these Philistines this day unto the fowl of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there's a God in Israel. Now that's what I'm about to do today. I, I'm talk, I ain't talking about tomorrow because I'm going to do something else tomorrow because I'm living in the supernatural. But this day, your head's going off. This day, you have messed with this group for the last time. The law of faith. Put it up on the board. Romans chapter 3. He says this, this is the law of faith. Where is boasting then? See, David wasn't boasting. It's, it's excluded. By what law? Of works? No, 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 no. But by the law of faith. The law of faith says whatever God is going to deliver into your hands must first be declared with your mouth. That's a tweet. Whatever God is going to deliver into your hand must first be declared with your mouth. And that's why he had to show up. Jesus came to the house of Jairus. Jairus' daughter was graveyard dead. And Jesus came in and declared something with his mouth. He wasn't trying to impress them. He wasn't boasting. He was putting a law in motion. The daughter is not dead. She's asleep. The Bible says to stop crying and start laughing. At him. See, that's called crazy faith. And I'm here to tell you right now, that God's people need to get some boldness to it. Because sometimes we're a little afraid to take God public. Because we think sometimes maybe it may not work. But let me tell you, let me give you the secret to this. This is the secret. You were never designed to go where you can't see. You see, when God said, Abram, Abraham, take your son up on the mountain and offer him up as a sacrifice. The, the, the world movies might have him crying, taking him up there, but that was not the reality. The reality is that Abraham gladly took him on up. Why? Because Abraham, the Bible says in, Ro in Hebrews chapter 11, he had already received Isaac raised up in a figure. Already received them raised up. He he'd seen the future. Yes. 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 See, see, you only risk when you haven't seen it. Jesus. That's right, amen. You, you, you only taking a risk when you don't know what's gonna happen. That's right. You were never meant to go where you can't see. That's right. Look at the scriptures, John chapter 16 and verse 13. Here's what he says. Howbeit, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he'll guide you into all truth, for he sh shall not speak of himself, 
But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he'll show you things to come. Who is this he's talking about? The Holy Ghost. He shall glorify me, he, for he shall receive of mine and show it to you. Watch this. All things that the Father has of mine, therefore said I, that he shall take of mine and what? He's going to show it to you. Now, the spirit of truth is going to guide you into all truth. Amen. And truth is the highest level of reality. Right. It's up here. It's in heaven. This is what's written about you in heaven. It's not written in heaven that you broke. In heaven, it's written that you're rich. And he said, let the poor say, in heaven is not writ written that you're weak. In heaven, it's written that you're strong. Let the weak say, I I'm just saying in heaven, it says that by his stripes, you are, you are healed now. And so you won't have to say what heaven says because that's the truth. And the word of God has got enough power to replace the fact. Yes. No, no, no. When I left uh, my company, secular company, IBM, it's been good to me in computers. But God said, I want you to start a ministry. I want you to go full time. Well, I was trying to go without seeing. Uh -huh. Each time I set a date, date come, come and go. I'm still right there. Well, I'm trying to go up against the gates of hell. Uh -huh. So what happened? I said, okay. Ran across a man preaching on the verse. Mark 11, uh, Mark chapter 10, 29 and 30, no man that's left house, mother, father, sister, brother, or watch this, lands. Land, see, lands, land, left land. Land is what they worked in that time. They had farms, but I was working job. So no man that has left job for my sake in the gospel, but he shall receive a hundredfold when? Now, not, not when I get to heaven, but we all get that. No, I ain't talking about that. I'm talking about now. And once I meditated that word and transformed my belief inside, I saw something different. And once I saw something different, call the phone, baby, I'm leaving this company. She said, pray the Lord. And I left that company. Watch this. And ain't look back. Why? Because I wasn't taking a risk. That's what they say. Uh, one of the, the fellow I, I know her from back at the company, she said, you know, when you left, we thought you was crazy. I, I wanted to tell it that was crazy faith. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, you weren't ever meant to go where you can't see. Yeah. Yeah. see if, you, if, you, if you can't see the good of a marriage, then it becomes a burden. All you got to do is see something different. Come on, don't shout me down because I'm preaching to you. What am I saying? Good food. In, this, in this thing here, we're talking about he went in the house, said she's not dead, she's just asleep. Now, let's, let's deal with death for just a minute now, because the Bible says by fear of death, people were all their lifetime subject to bondage. That's Hebrews chapter 2. So we don't fear death. I said we don't fear death. When, when Jesus rose from the dead, he says, now I got the keys to death and hell. So what death could just come in your room like a grim reaper and just snatch your life out, can't do it no more. And anyway, when people leave here, when they die, don't look at it as they dead. No, they, the Bible calls them sleep. And they have just moved to another city. You see, the Bible describes it over in Revelation 21, a city. It's a city. They come through the gates when they leave here and be with the Lord. And it's a city. It's just like your cousin going to L.A. You don't cry, oh, are you going to L.A.? No, honey. She just went to L.A., just packed her bags and went on to L.A. She'll see you. Don't trip. <laughs> Are y'all with me? 
<laughs> so what am I saying? Yeah, you, you got to watch that. Plus the fact, you don't know what that city is. You need to read the Bible. Because cities, streets are gold. Somebody told me, I heard a lady say, she was preaching this. She said, you know, if you're in heaven and you got a gravel driveway, you're going to be the laughing stock of the community. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so, so I'm saying, look at it totally different. Now, where was I? Uh, okay. No, I'm talking about this one man thing. Because it's just one person. And he used David. One man. How about a woman? Let's go to Esther chapter 5. Now it came to pass on the third day that Esther put on her royal apparel. Lord have mercy. And stood in the inner court of the king's house, over against the king's house, and the king sat upon his royal throne and the royal house over against the gate of the house. Now notice what Esther's doing. She got no business up in there. Got it? But she fasted three days. That's right. She did. And got God with her. Now she can go anywhere. And when she showed up, normally if you don't come and you're announced and you haven't been invited, your head goes off. 